open up to Jeremiah chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 31. We're continuing our journey through the book of uh, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah. And um, I don't know about you all, but this has been um, a good exercise in having God reveal the areas of my life that needed to be revealed and areas that I really didn't think uh, I needed any correction in at all, um, I've discovered I need all sorts of correction. Um, I have a little quote in the sermon outline. It's basically pretty early on there. God is using Jeremiah to take the scales off my eyes. And when I look in the mirror, I'm becoming more and more uncomfortable with what I'm seeing. If uh, the book of Jeremiah is doing to you what it's done to me, This is both a painful and a very, very good thing. If you're a believer in Jesus, you want to become more and more like Jesus. And um, in order to do that, we need to be in conformity with uh, God's word. Just as Jesus said he didn't come to abolish God's word, but to fulfill it and to do everything that God had required him to do. And so this is part of the painful process you have to go through in order to become more like Jesus. Um, And I think Jeremiah is doing a really good job. This passage is um, one you may not initially think that is going to apply to you, that only applies to those people that are um, really sick, really perverted, that take advantage of the weak and, um, and vulnerable. But I think if we look at it the way Jeremiah wants us to look at it, and I think the way Jesus encouraged us to look at the Old Testament through the Sermon on the Mount, um, I think all of us have things we need to hear from Jeremiah on this particular passage. Um, he he's basically is saying that the prophets and the priests are lying and doing things their own way. They're not doing things God's way at all. And the kings, the prophets, and priests are all um, taking advantage of the weak, using their position of power to uh, advance themselves at the expense of other people. We do that in ways that we're not always aware of. Um... I'll wait until we get in the message to, to share that, but uh, I, think, I think Jeremiah has a lot to say to us all, and I'm going to have a Christian come up and lead, read this passage, and then we'll talk about it. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 26 through 31. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Jeremiah 5, 26 through 31. Among my people are wicked men who lie in wait like men who snare birds and those who set traps to catch men. Like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit, and they have become rich and powerful and have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fatherless to win it. They do not defend the rights of the poor. Should I not punish them for for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority, and my people love in this way. But what will you do in the end? You may be seated. Well, I don't know if you caught those last two phrases. My people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? That's a lot of what we're uh, going to be looking at as the end of this kind of a mindset, this kind of a perspective. I would encourage you to pull out your sermon online. There is a lot of quotes that I'm going to be referring to. Um, I think it would be very, very helpful to follow along. Question to be answered is this. What does God have to tell us through Jeremiah about the destiny of those who choose to exploit the helpless? And folks, um, you don't have to be in a political position of power or an economic position of power to exploit someone. You can be in an information position of power. You can be in a uh, social position of power. You can just be um, (laughs) in an environmental position of power. I watch little kids use their power over their parents on a regular basis in the Walmart checkout lane. The mother is ready to check out, and the little kid looks at those Snickers bars and goes, Wow, what a Snickers bar! And the mother is tempted to yield to that manipulation. Mothers don't do that. That three year old will one day be a 
16-year-old brat if you continue to encourage them in their uh, exploitation of your social predicament. Our culture no longer allows uh, mothers to discipline in the checkout line of Walmart. But if you get the car and put shades in the car, (laughs) you can take care of the matter there. We, uh, we manipulate in all sorts of ways to get our own, own way. So what does God have to say to us, Jeremiah, about the destiny of those who choose to exploit the helpless? We can rest and take a heart that God will avenge himself on them. Also, we must always be alert to our sinful inclination, inclination to exploit others through manipulation, domination, deception, or abuse. And there's a lot of other ways besides just those four that we can exploit others. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, a phrase that keeps coming up in my brain as I, we, I went through this week was one by Lord Acton, um, the um, uh, British statesman. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Whenever you have any kind of power, even just the information power that you know something somebody else does not know, you will be tempted to use that power to your own benefit. As I said in my statement very early on in in the message, Jeremiah is pointing out ways that I am not very Christ-like that I didn't even know. Um... One of the ways I've I've discovered that I manipulate you all and I manipulate conversations is that I can say something in eight words that will communicate what I need to communicate, okay, in order to keep the conversation going, in order to share a position or whatever. I can communicate it in maybe eight words. But I'll use ten words because those two extra words will make you like me more. And I can gain favor either by name dropping or showing something where I was personally involved. or something. I, Just those two extra words can make all the difference in the world on how you feel to me. Folks, that's manipulation. I'm, Brad Shaw and I get together on a regular basis and he quite often will tell me um, where there's a proverb in, in the Bible that says basically this, where, mer, where, mer, where words are many, sin is not absent. Where words are many, sin is not absent. Boy, the mouth is really, really good at manipulation. And what comes out of our mouth is nothing but a reflection of what's in our hearts. Pastors are manipulators. I've watched pastors take advantage of situations and I I was embarrassed because they expected um, certain privileges because they were a pastor. I'm very, very concerned about our medical community and the manipulation and um, deception and exploitation that takes place within the medical community. I see it all the time because I'm in hospitals and I'm with patients a lot. Folks, I'm, I'm fearful that we are so immersed in our Darwinian culture that we have adopted, even if it's subliminally, and we're not even conscious of it, we've adopted a survival of the fittest mentality where we do whatever we can to advance ourselves and we really are not conscious of the Spirit of God warning us of where we're going and what we're doing in creating a world of hostility when we uh, take advantage of people. The word for the day is pray, P-R-E-Y. 
because it's very, very easy to prey on other people. Jay Leno was one time um, kind of finding out how his audience, uh, how much they knew about Ten Commandments. And by the way, most Americans, 80% of Americans are un- unable to name any more than four of the Ten Commandments, which I found absolutely stunning. Um, but Jay Leno was, was kind of reflecting on this, and he asked uh, the audience, what's one of the Ten Commandments? And the first hand that shot up said, God helps those that help themselves. That is not in the Bible. <laughs> but there is a close uh, statement to it that is in the Bible that doesn't say it specifically, but is definitely at the heart of God. God helps those who can't help themselves and know it. Folks, our salvation is deeply dependent upon the God of the universe helping us when we're helpless. Because in order for us to stand before a holy and righteous God, we aren't holy and righteous. He demands perfection. In fact, Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How you doing? None of us. But God in his grace and his mercy has sent Jesus who was perfect so that by trusting in Jesus, we can have that perfection given to us because we trust in Christ. We are now in Christ and being in Christ, his perfection is ours. And so we can stand before Christ not because we are able to help ourselves be perfect, but because Jesus is able to help the helpless and know it and confess their sins. He is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what I want us to see. That's where we need to be, helping those who cannot help themselves and know it. So what does God say about wicked exploiters? Number one, they prey on the vulnerable. Verses 28 and 29, their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fatherless to win it. He's talking about here the sin of omission, not the sin of commission. He is talking about you don't stand up for the fatherless, you don't stand up for the helpless, you don't stand up for the vulnerable when you have an opportunity to protect them. That's a lot deeper than just not taking advantage of the weak. That's a lot more extensive. Should I not punish him for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I love this quote by Mark uh, Leberton. It's in your sermon outline. The realignment of power is fundamental to the cause of justice because much of the twisted soul of injustice is the abuse of power. It's in your sermon outline. Whether the injustice is poverty, bonded slavery, land grabbing, forced prostitution, hunger, rape, or racism, we find abuse of power. Likewise, an abuse of power is at play in even more mundane examples of injustice. Gossip. Manipulation. Coercion, lying, deception, or libel. At the core of it all lies an abuse of power. Nothing thwarts God's purposes more than twisted power. And nothing renews God's purposes more than redeeming power. And power can be nothing more than just simple information that somebody else doesn't know. I want to give you a classic example using my wife. And you're going, oh, here he goes again. He must be in trouble every Sunday he goes home. (laughs) Only, well, never mind. My wife was going, this is probably 12 years ago. It was when gas prices were $1.72, so a long time ago. About 10, 12 years ago or so, my wife was going from Hillsdale to Adrian. I can't remember now why she was going. Do you remember now why she was going? Oh, upwards basketball. Oh, yeah, that was in Adrian at that time. Um, so she was going to, to Adrian to watch the grandkids play upwards basketball. When she went through Clayton on, on 34, you know that gas station on, the, on 34 just south of Clayton? She noticed the gas was $1.72, and she thought, when I come back, when the gas tank is a little more empty, I'll get gas because that's a pretty good price. And so she went to upwards basketball and came back, and guess what? It hiked up seven cents. It was now $1.79. 
And so she thought, oh, it's still okay, but man, I lost $7 a gallon. I'll get it anyway. And she pulled up, got, filled up the, the gas tank, about 10 uh, gallons worth of gasoline, and looked at the bill, and it was $1.79. They had charged her 17.9 cents per gallon because they had put the decimal in the wrong place. Now she has a dilemma because she could run home and tell me to grab every gas can we could possibly find (laughs) because they have gas for 17 cents a gallon in Clayton and call all of her friends and say, hurry. But she did the Christian thing. She did the thing that Jeremiah is encouraging us to do. She did the thing that God is encouraging us to do. She went in and said, you know, you have a problem here because I just got 10 gallons worth of gas for $1.79. And the clerk was very, very grateful because guess whose hide it was coming out of? His hide. That's the kind of world God wants us to live in. When we're watching out for the vulnerable, the helpless, the weak, those those that don't know any better. Because that kind of world is worth living in. But if we're all taking advantage of each other all the time, that's a dog-eat-dog jungle world. Margaret Mead, I don't know if you remember Margaret Mead, but during the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, she was kind of the leading anthropologist and was on a lot of talk shows and on the cover of a lot of magazines and that kind of stuff. But Margaret Mead was one time asked by a student, what's the earliest evidence that you have of civilized man? And she said, a healed femur. Why? Because in a dog-eat-dog world, a broken femur would have meant you'd perished. But the fact that the person lived long enough in order for it to heal meant that somebody took care of them. Where are we at? Two. What does God say about wicked exploiters? They love going their own way. Verses 30 and 31. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? Folks, I know Jeremiah is hard. I know Jeremiah is painful. I know attendance is suffering as a result. But we need this. The good news of the gospel will, ever, will never become great news until we understand the bad news about ourselves. And then the greatness of our salvation in Jesus becomes even greater because we realize how far short we have fallen from God's glory. But as long as we can go to church and have the pastor pat us on the back and say, oh, you're all really good people, you barely even need Jesus because you're so good. But how many churches do we go into, that's exactly what's going on. Folks, Your pastor is in desperate need of Jesus. And if it isn't for Jesus and his spirit operating in me, I wouldn't do anything good. Because I would be here to take care of number one and to do all that I could to see that I got ahead and that my needs were taken care of and that I made all the money and that my reputation was the one that was really going to stand out. We, we can get so enamored in the good things that God has given us that we lose track of where our soul is. Jesus taught a lot about that. I'm reminded of an email that I got from my, my cousin um, that I grew up across the driveway from in, in my childhood. Her daughter wrote 
Gina and I an email, um, actually wrote the whole family an email when she was in Iraq. She was a, a, was she a Marine? She was a Marine. She's a tough little girl. Um, anyway, kind of like Corey. You know? um, but she sent an email from, from Iraq, and this is what she said. One thing that will be difficult to get used to will be the way Americans take advantage of living in the United States. Freedom is not free, and shame on anyone who takes their freedoms for granted. As we recently gained a new commander-in-chief, I've been thinking more, even more, about the condition of our nation. I came across this quote from Thomas Jefferson a few days ago. This is from Thomas Jefferson. Listen very, very carefully to what Thomas Jefferson said 240 years ago. A government that is big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. And here we are. Why do we elect the people we elect? Because they'll get us what we want. Folks, that is death to a nation. And I remember reading, um, this may have been probably 15 years ago, but I remember reading the founding fathers that said, once the voter starts to realize that they can get what they want by voting in certain politicians, it will be the death of this nation. Where are we at? Folks, we should be electing people who do the right thing, who do the just thing, who do what's best for the nation. But right now, we have about 535 cowards in less than sterling statesmen in Washington, D.C., who do what they do in order to get reelected, not to do what's right. And the problem is, is us. Because we don't have the courage to vote in the people who will do the hard thing to get us back on track. We vote them in because they'll give us what we want. We've got to be bigger than that, people. We've got to understand the needs of this nation and find the people who will stand up for those needs and do the right thing and not worried about getting elected again. I'm not sure, well, maybe I know one. I'm not sure I know any politicians that are of that character. I, I remember coming across an uh, article by George R. Orwell. Um, it was called The Severed Wasp. And George Orwell was on his back patio, and he was outside, and a, a wasp had come down and was eating the jam off of his bread. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to watch bees or those kind of thing eat, eat that kind of sweet stuff, but it's absolutely fascinating. In fact, Gene and I were on the back patio of our, our uh, soon-to-be paradise, um, <laughs> if I can ever live that long, um, and I, I had spilled some lemonade or pop or something on the, on the table, and a, a bee, a bu- uh, uh, what do they call them, a honeybee, honeybee had come up and spotted that little drop of sugar water and stopped, and it was fascinating to watch him suck it in and just suck that little puddle of, of uh, lemonade or, or pop or whatever, suck it dry. You ever watch that? It's absolutely fascinating. But anyway, George Orwell talks about how this wasp had come and was eating his jam, and he had taken a knife and cut the head away from the esophagus, from the body of the, of the wasp, so that it was eating the jam and coming out his back end all the same time. He was totally oblivious to the fact that he had been severed because he was so indulging in the jam. And he did not realize he had been severed until he was trying to fly away and then realize he was done. And George Orwell says, that's a lot like us. We so indulge our bodies in the sweetness of this land that our souls have been severed from us and we don't even know it until it's time to fly. And then we realize we can't. Do not allow the temptations, do not allow the good things of this world to become the main things. Trust in the Lord 
Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then everything else will take care of itself. But if we do not seek God first, if we seek the pleasures, if we seek the sweetness, if we seek the things, we may find ourselves severed, going our own way. And I've said it before, but it says it twice in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to a man, but that way is the way of death. Number three, what does God say about wicked exploiters? God will right all wrongs. Verse 29, should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on the nation such as this? And this is where a lot of 21st century Christians part ways. Because a lot of 21st century Christians say, oh, I don't like this justice part of God. I don't like the fact that God punishes sin. I don't like the fi- fact that he, he is uh, going to execute justice and rights all wrongs. I want a God that loves I'm going to stand on a pew. I can feel it. (laughs) You can't do that to the God of the universe. You cannot sever his justice and his love any more than you can sever his wrath and his compassion, his patience and his justice. They are a package. They come together. Steve, uh, Steve Brown, Tim Keller has an absolutely wonderful quote. Please track it with me. It's in your sermon outline. Here you may say, I don't like the idea of a wrath of God. I want a God of love. The problem is that if you want a loving God, you have to have an angry God. Please think about it. Loving people can get angry not in spite of their love, but because of their love. In fact, the more closely and deeply you love people in your life, the angrier you get. Haven't you noticed that? When you see people who are harmed or abused, you get mad. If you see people abusing themselves, you get mad at them out of love. Your senses of love and justice are activated together, not in opposition to each other. If you see people destroying themselves or destroying other people and you don't get mad, it's because you don't care. You're too absorbed in yourself. You're too cynical. You're too hard. The more loving you are, the more ferociously angry you will be at whatever harms your beloved. I can tell you that's true from my own experience. I can tell you that's true from reason. The problem is, in 21st century America, what's coming true is what Jesus said would come true in Matthew chapter 24 when he talked about the last times. Because Jesus said that in the end, the love of many will grow cold. We just don't care. So it's easy for us to say, oh, I want a God that loves. I don't want a God that has wrath and gets angry. You can't go there, folks. Because if this is a fallen world, and any idiot can see that it is, and if innocent people are getting run over, and if wrong is sometimes victorious over right, how can you not get angry? Unless you don't care. Do you want to live in a world where people don't care? Or do you want to live in a world where when an injustice takes place, there's somebody ready to fight in order to make the wrong right? I know which world I want to live in. I'm reminded of Thomas Jefferson's quote. we better care about justice because we're empowering a government that if it chooses not to live in a just way and if it chooses to use its power in an absolute way, we're helpless to stop them. God knows the best way to live and the best way to live is to fight for justice, to care deeply enough and to love deeply enough to make sure that the wrongs are made right. At least do all that we can to make sure that those wrongs are made right.
Worship point is this. Before God, all of us are weak, orphaned, vulnerable, and helpless. Worship the God who takes delight in helping rather than exploiting those who cannot help themselves. Boy, I look at the Greek gods and the Roman gods and goddesses, and I am so grateful that the God of the universe isn't like any of them. They were scary. Gospel application. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He did not consider equality with God God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is a world in which it's being promoted as a survival of the fittest, Darwinian, um, do what you can in order to advance, but folks, You don't want to live in that kind of world. We need to be in the world that God is promoting. It's survival of the weakest. Being willing to be made weak for the sake of other people. I love this quote by uh, Noni Romundo, and, and by Providence, she is here today. Only when you're down do you tend to look up. And Jeremiah is forcing us to look up on a consistent basis. Because he refuses to have you think you have arrived. He refuses to have you think that you are without need of a savior. He refuses to have you think you are righteous in and of yourself. And I know that you don't like to hear this, but folks, that's only when the, when the gospel becomes very, very good and very, very powerful when we understand how desperately we need Jesus. Spiritual challenge. Consider the implications that God loves to help those who cannot help themselves and know it. Consider also what it means to trust God to right all wrongs. What end do you project? I love the way that the um, text for today ends. But what will you do in the end? I remember in philosophy class, the philosophy class that I actually learned something. I was in several philosophy classes, one in Huntington College in Huntington, Indiana. I learned nothing there. And then I was in several philosophy classes in seminary. I learned a ton. But I remember Dr. Nash, Dr. Ron Nash, absolutely wonderful philosophy teacher. He told us, the way you check a philosophical system is you push it to the wall. Run with that idea as far as you can run with it. And if you can live with it, then it's a good idea. If you can't live with it, it's a bad idea. Nietzsche's idea was basically to take Darwinianism and make him the Ubermann. He was German. The Superman. Not burdened by morals. Not burdened by conscience. Not burdened by weaknesses of caring for other people, but to force yourself ahead and conquer because that was your destiny to conquer. Guess who believed in Nietzsche's teaching? Adolf Hitler. In fact, he bought all of his army commanders, thus spoke Zarathustra, which was Nietzsche's uh, basically uh, pattern for living. Why did he buy him that? Because he wanted all of his officers to be officers to be that ruthless, that much pursuing the Superman. And anybody that didn't live up to his expectations of what it meant to be human, you just did away with them. That's why blacks and Jews had no place in Adolf Hitler's uh, economy, which made the 1936 Olympics all that more wonderful. When Jesse Owens humiliated Adolf Hitler in Berlin because Jesse Owens won four gold medals. Well, Adolf Hitler went, there's a God! And he will take any philosophical system and turn it inside out. The only philosophical system you can push to the end, and it works, is Jesus's. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a system we can all live with. No, 
That's a system in which we'll all thrive in. It's good preaching, Pastor Keith. Consider the implications that God loves to help those who cannot help themselves and know it. Consider also what it means to trust God and uh, to right all wrongs. What end do you project? Part of uh, what's happened in 21st century America is we've bought into so many of the uh, current philosophical systems without pushing the law and finding out that they really don't work. And now we're starting to make decisions based upon those philosophical systems like Darwinism. Um, it's the reason why we can, we can have abortions with no conscience at all. And folks, the more we do it, the more our conscience is being numbed. Another, another technological um, thing is taking place that has just recently kind of hit, hit the fan um, was human gene editing. I don't know if you knew this or not, but a Chinese um, geneticist actually rearranged human DNA to create the human he wanted to create. And the whole rest of the uh, genetic engineering world went, you can't do that. Because the minute you make human beings a product of your engineering, you no longer look at them as humans. They are a product. And folks, technology is eroding what it means to be human away. Psychological teaching is eroding what it means to be human, is eroding it away. One of the things that we need to really, really watch carefully is how we're giving excuses for all sorts of behaviors and just saying, well, that's the way they're wired. We no longer hold people accountable for their decisions anymore because they're wired that way. Do you know what that does? It puts them down a notch in their humanity because if they're not accountable for what they're actions are, they're no longer human. That's a given for human beings. And the minute that happens, we can manipulate them without guilty consciences because, well, they can't handle themselves anyway. They can't do this for themselves anyway. I'll do this. I'll make these decisions for them. Be careful of where we are, where are we going. I have several uh, quotes that are in your sermon online. I won't take time to read them right now. I'll give you a chance to do that later. <laughs> so what? Everyone finds themselves helpless to defend themselves from those more powerful who choose to exploit. We need to trust God in those circumstances and make sure we are never guilty of manipulation or the same offenses. A couple of quick stories. I want to read one of the quotes that's under the uh, so what, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Um, I, those of you familiar with me know that I ran a guitar store for 12 years from 1974 to 1986. Uh, I ran a guitar store in Huntington, Indiana. Um, you need to understand that this, we served basically the northeast corner of, of, uh, of, uh, of Indiana. Um, and I had a lot of customers come in, and there was one guitar that everybody drooled over. Probably for 10 years, everybody wanted to, to get their hands on a 1954 Les Paul gold top. Um, it's just, at that time, uh, this is probably early 1980s, it was worth about $4,000 in good condition. Well... I'll never forget the day an uh, elderly lady, well, she was probably in her 70s or something like that, walked into my store holding an old uh, alligator shell uh, Gibson case, and I went, could it be? And she opened it up, and it, there was a mint. It had been played once, had the original strings on it. This is 30 years later, a mint 1954 Les Paul gold top. It had the price tags on it. I said, oh my goodness. Lady, do you know what you have here? He says, well, yeah, this is my son's uh, guitar. We bought it for him for his 14th birthday or something like that. 
He never played it. He put it in his, in his closet, and several years later, he went to Nam. He got killed in Nam. It's been in the closet ever since, and we're finally trying to clean up some of the things in his house. Um, would you give me what we paid for it in 1954? Would you give me $100 for it? I said, lady, I'd give you $200 if I had it. But lady, I can't give you right away what this guitar is worth. Um, I'd give you $2,000 for it if I had it, but I need, I need a couple of weeks to get that money around. Here's what you can do. You go up to Elderly Music in Lansing, Michigan. You show them what you got, but don't walk out of there any le- for any less than $3,500. And I never heard from her again. But when she left with that guitar, I cried. But I could not take advantage of her, even though all she wanted was what she put into it 30 years earlier. Why couldn't I take advantage of her? Because the teachings of Jesus kept haunting me. And the only thing that stopped me from exploiting that poor lady that didn't know any better was the teachings of Jesus. I was in youth ministry for a long time. And I can tell you, I saw relationships between teenagers that were incredibly abusive. I remember one child who was dating another child of the opposite sex. I won't give sex because some of you from Addison would put the dots together and then I'd be in big trouble. But the one person in this relationship threatened the other person in the relationship, if you ever leave me, I'll kill myself. I spent a long time with that other person saying, how do I get out of this relationship? I don't love this person anymore. And I'm afraid if I leave this person, they're going to kill themselves and I will have to carry that responsibility all my life. What do I do? I won't tell you what I told them, but it got me in big trouble and eventually led to my leaving the church over there, to being voted out. Folks, that's manipulation. It's from the pit of hell. And whether it's a three-year-old in line at Walmart wanting a Snickers bar or a 16-year-old that's threatening the other person to commit suicide if you ever leave me, or taking advantage of somebody that doesn't know any better, it's all exploitation, and God hates it. You will never have the heart. You will never have the will. You will never have the spiritual alertness to love like that unless the Spirit of God is living in you and calling to attention, you can't go there. And you can only have that when you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. When Jesus is living and resident in your heart. I don't know about you all, but I know what world I want to live in. I want to live in a world in which we're watching out and taking care of the needs of other people where we're not taking advantage of somebody just because they don't know any better. And that's the world God is trying to promote, but our culture is going in completely the opposite direction. We need Jesus living in our heart.